So my next guest needs a little introduction, but I'll give it a shot. Um, Thomas Wolfe co-founded Hugging Face in 2016 with his two co-founders. Hugging Face has since become a leading pillar in the AI community, really championing the cause for open source AI models and keeping AI open to all. Um, it's since become a leading repository of open source AI models with millions of data sets, models, and data apps publicly available for free. And as CSO, Thomas has really been at the forefront of this. So I'm genuinely, truly thrilled and thankful to welcome him to the stage today. Ladies and gentlemen, please give a huge round of applause for Thomas Wolf. So uh, Thomas, thank you very much for joining us today. Really Thanks a lot, Vicky. Yeah. So um, maybe I, I wanted to kind of level set. Um, you know, you're a big believer in open source AI models. Yeah. Um, for the members of the audience, maybe we could just try and get a sense for why you're really so passionate about models becoming open source and remaining open source. Um, I'd be curious to get that perspective for the, for the audience. Yeah, it's a long story, actually. It started way before I was in AI. So I had a multiple career. I started as a physicist. And I was working on cold temperature superconductors, right now what, uh, what we use for quantum computers, right? But 20 years ago, it was not really working. I mean, nowadays, I don't know if you believe it's working or not. Yeah, I have a strong opinion. And so in this field, most of the research had been done by the Russian in the Soviet Union. And so I don't know if any of you are, have been a, are scientists, but getting access to knowledge is really hard in science. You need to pay for articles, like nature articles, is very expensive. And for me, I had to track down this Russian written article. So it was really hard. And basically, I discovered that getting access to knowledge was something super critical to be able to build things, to build new things, to in discover invention. And so then I, I became a lawyer. But then when I went back to, to computer science, I discovered this extension of open science, which is open source, where basically people, they don't even just share how to build things, but they share the blueprints on how they build the thing. And I was like, wow, that's, that's crazy enabler to, to, to do new discoveries, right? You don't even just share the theory of cold temperature superconductors, but you share the blueprints of the cryosta you build you know, to cool this material down and use them. And so that, I think that's where I, I can realize this is something that can unlock so much creativity, so much, you know, a, a, a so much easier way to build on top of discoveries, and I became just uh, in love with it. Makes sense. And I mean, I feel like we had a lot of talk earlier about the risks. I mean, for example, with Daria and Demis' talk, I guess, do you see open source as a real way to kind of mitigate those risks going forward, or how do you think about that? It's a big question on the risks. I think we are very aligned with, with Dario, I think, and that's what he was saying earlier today, if you were there, which is, Current models, I don't think, really reach any, any level of risk. I've not seen anyone saying, oh, Lama 2, Lama 3 is extremely dangerous. We should not release this. So I think everyone is aligned in the fact that these models are, are just you know, something that's nice, and we can build a lot of, lot of application on top of them. So I think for current models, we are, we're, we're pretty safe open sourcing them. And then it brings a lot of safety in addition that we don't think about. But let's see you know, if we start using AI everywhere in the world. And let's say we all have to go through a single data center, like OpenAI data center or Anthropic data center. It's a little bit like if you know, the internet was invented and all data had to go through just one company you know, who kind of invented the internet. If these things go down, like maybe the, the CrowdStrike uh, issue you know, last summer, if this data center go down, everything stops. And if you're a bit like me, I guess you, you, you understood really that AI is, is going to be a bit everywhere soon. You know? It's going to be like the internet. We're going to have AI, AI agents or AI tools really everywhere. So we really want to have a lot of safety, I think, in our infrastructure. And the best way to have safety and to have res resilience is to actually distribute our compute everywhere. And I think the easiest way to do that is just to have open source model as the basic building block. Because it, open source is a very easy way to distribute compute because a lot of you know, just to take an example, if you take the most downloaded models on Hugging Face, most of the time they provide it, you can access or use them through API by provided by maybe 15 or 16 different providers, right? If you use a closed source model, in majority of the case, you only have one, maybe two providers. So if they're down, you're kind of down, basically. Makes sense. I think on a related note, I actually wanted to ask something else about Hugging Face. You know, there are many great things about Hugging Face. But one of the really great things is just being able to go onto the front page and see what's trending with the AI community. You know, you've had your finger on the pulse for the past you know, five years on what's been trending. Do you see any sort of key emerging trends or themes 
um, in the open source AI models that you know you want to share with the audience? I think these trends, they, they reflect the trends of AI. Or they use it a little bit in advance of face, so it's a good way to detect them. So it was at some point, was the, the, you know, the image model flux w was everywhere on the training models. Um, and then we, re more recently, we've seen smaller models being very trendy. So models that can fit on a smartphone, that can fit on laptop. They've been trending very strongly at the end of last year. I think as people understand that you, you, you maybe when you want to build application, you don't need always you know, the most heavy, the most complex model, but you can do a lot of things with smaller models. Uh, more recently, obviously, DeepSeek has been strongly trending. And in the wake of DeepSeek, we see all this reasoning model. So we're starting to get used to have a model that not just answer the question, but start to ponder why we ask the question and how I should answer this. Makes sense. Actually, I wanted to pull a little bit on that thread of DeepSeek. So you know, we saw what an extraordinary team could do and, and build. Um, and it brings me back to this idea of open source and science melding together. Now, you yourself have a PhD in, in quantum physics. Anton, who was just on stage, also has a, a physics background. Do you think in Europe we're doing enough to bring you know, top caliber quality science talent into entrepreneurship, incentivize them to build really great companies? And if the answer is no, I'm guessing, you know, what would your prescriptions be? H how would you improve it? No, I don't think we do nearly enough. I think scientists are usually, there is a set of, uh, in particular, I'm talking about France, where, where I did my PhD, for instance. There really is a set of regulation that kind of, you know, discourage you st f from starting a company if, you, if you're, like, actually a professor or if you're, if you're actually involved. Even when you're in PhD, for us, it's really hard to have PhD students join Hugging Face for internships. You're just not made for that. Uh, we have a couple of them, and they usually need to join in, like, not being paid and doing, like, a collaboration. Well, I think in the U.S. or other companies, it's, it's much easier to work to work with, with university or to get professors or, or, or researchers start, start, start a, a company. And then, and then you even have, because of that, you have also a lack of examples. So professors and people who really follow the, the scientific path, they don't really have a lot of role model that they can associate, you know, successful professor that started large company, which I know, I know a lot of them in the US, for instance. And I think this is really one thing that is kind of regulatory, so we could solve this by actually just changing that. Understood. Um, I'm just conscious of time. I think, you know, we'll probably have to transfer one or two more questions. One that I was really very keen to ask you about, you know, we saw Dario and Demis on stage earlier today. Um, they're from the closed source community. I'd be curious to now get a little bit of the open source side of this discussion. You know, they talked a lot about sort of the risks, AGI, etc. I, I recently saw maybe an hour ago, you posted on LinkedIn about the talk. You said you had some thoughts that you were maybe going to write into a blog post. Um, I think journalists call it an exclusive or a preview. Would you be able to share some of your thoughts, observations on, on, on that discussion and whether you had anything that you wanted to add to what they were saying? Yeah, maybe. So this is not fully fledged, and I want to write really a long part. Um, but if you have not read uh, Dario's Machine of Loving Grace, which is a very positive view of AI, you should probably do it. So I did it two times. I did it the first time, and I was totally amazed. I was like, AI is going to change the world. And then I read, it, I read it a second time, and I thought, this is all just bullshit. It's just selling me bullshit. And, and why? And I think I can tell you a little bit about my, my own story to explain. So explain, basically, his, his whole essay is about you know, saying in, in one year or two years, we're going to have a country of geniuses in a data center, so what he called a country of Einstein in a data center. And I think we're just going to have a country of very obsequious consultant in a data center, which is very different. Let me tell you. So I was always, it will sound a little bit arrogant, but wait, wait for the end and you will see why. I was always a very good student. I was always getting straight A, so I went to the top French university, then I got accepted at MIT to a PhD. And then when I became a, a researcher, then I basically during my PhD, I discovered I was, I was actually a very bad researcher. I just everyone around me had great ideas. And I was just struggling. I was like, if I don't read it in a book, I don't think it's true, right? And, and I, I questioned myself a lot. I was like, why can I get both the be best grades and be such a bad researcher? And I think the, the reason is that to be a good researcher, you don't actually really need to have good grades. I mean, you need to be smart, right? But we all know these stories about Einstein having bad grades. And actually, if you look in history, there's a lot of great researchers 
who were not so good at school, or at least they didn't fit in the mold, right? But what you need to do, you need to have this very strong you know, will to, to question the status quo, right? You need to be this Copernicus or Galilei who say, what if the Earth was not at the center, while everyone around you, all the textbook you've read, or all the text you, you've been trained on, if you're a language model, say, the Earth is the center of universe, right? And this is, I think, something we don't even measure for models. And the difference is the same difference between being able to answer a question and ask the right question. And if you look at all the top evaluation for language models, and if you're following, there is like very bullish names recently. There was humanity's last exam. I don't know if you follow this evaluation last, last uh, month. Or like frontier math. And they're all the same. They ask very good question. So usually today we ask PhDs to write questions for language model, right? But all these questions have clear answer. And then you, the model should just find the answer, right? But this is not how science works. This is not how Einstein works. The, the difficulty is to ask the right question, is to ask the what if question, to say, what if the Earth was not at the center of the universe, right? Well, all your exams say, the Earth is at the, end, the, the center, you need to, uh, yeah. If you're reading book, you know, or like science fiction, you probably read the Hitchhiker Galaxy uh, guy, right? Like, and you know the answer is 42. And the main problem is what is the question, right? And so we don't even evaluate that model. So what we should build, and that's where I still need to, to flesh out my ideas, but we should be evaluation on how they can build good questions that challenge the status quo. And every huge invention in science, you know, you've got maybe one per year, and usually it's kind of Nobel Prize. M many times when you dive in, it's like a researcher saying, I think we're wrong there. And I have these small experiments, and everyone's like, oh, that's just an artifact. No, I have these small experiments. I think it's the direction that we should change our paradigm. So that's the notion of paradigm shift in science. And so if we want a country of real Einstein in a data center, we need to have models that are able to question the paradigm. Otherwise, we'll just get, like me, straight-A students. They're very good at explaining the knowledge they have, but they're very bad at finding new pieces of knowledge. Uh, it's super. OK, I should probably write this blog post. Yeah, I, I was going to say, I think there'll be a lot of traffic to your, to your blog. Uh, and I, I'm hoping that you know, from now, you'll be a little bit more regular on the blogging. Uh, we'll talk about that a little bit later. Um, no, that's great. I mean, to bring it full circle, uh, you know, here's to the rebels. It's also maybe you talked about Einstein and science. It's clearly a trait that entrepreneurs also have. I'm not sure necessarily all entrepreneurs were the best at school, but it's about challenging the status quo. And, it's actually much wider than science. Every, every great entrepreneur, I think, is a rebel in a way that wants to challenge status quo. I don't know if we want just all AI to be rebels. So that's yeah. another question, right? I think just I'll enough leave that rebel. To die on. Yeah, not too much rebel. Well, Thomas, uh, unfortunately, we're a bit strapped on time, and that's all we really have time for today. But it's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you for sharing your wisdom. I think we've already enjoyed it. And like I said, I think everyone's going to be flocking to your blog to get your full digest on it uh, a little bit later today. Thanks, VK. Thank you so much. Ladies and gentlemen, Thomas.